It's good to see some uh, new faces here tonight. Glad you could come out and be a part of this. Hope this is an encouragement to you. If there's a book that people are absolutely interested in, it is the Revelation. Sometimes we think of that book being isolated from the rest of Scripture. And yet, as we're going to see tonight, again, this book has been spoken about throughout the Old Testament. And as a result of that, um, we're going to be able to look at some Old Testament Scripture and see how it connects with the Revelation in the fourth chapter, uh, giving explanation. Uh, There are different ways of interpreting Scripture. One of those that I really love to, to study out is called a progressive revelation. And what that means is throughout the Scripture, God sheds more light on a subject or event throughout Scripture. Oftentimes the New Testament even will shed light on the Old Testament in explanation. Even sometimes the typologies, the further you go in the New, it's like, oh, that's what God intended, or that's what God was actually talking about. And we're going to see that a little bit uh, as we get into this tonight. I want to give a real quick uh, overview, not near as extensive, just to remind us of the, of the highlight of, of uh, what we have been talking about with eschatology. The word eschatology comes, to mean, comes from the meaning of last and a study. So it's a study of last days. So when we say the word eschatology, we're talking about a study of last days days. And that's what we we are really, really all of us interested in. Uh, So right now, we are in what God calls in Revelation chapter 1, the things that are. And then in chapter 4, he says, and then there's going to be things that are going to be happening hereafter. And that's what we're going to be getting into. So, So the things that are right now, God describes it, we are in the last days right now. He describes what the last days are like. The closer to rapture, I believe that we're going to see transitions in in spirituality, um, the spirit of Antichrist, the the things that you're going to see, we're going to get it in chapter number 9, he says they just won't repent of their murders or sorceries, witchcraft, all this stuff. Well, we're seeing that really getting wheels now and starting to happen more and more. And that's why God says in last days, perilous or troublesome times are going to come. So there's going to be a lot of uncertainties the closer we get to, to rapture. So, so it's not necessarily a sign, if you will, but it is telling us you're going to progressively see the longer we go towards the coming of Christ for the church, it getting worse. So once that rapture happens and you and I are snatched and taken up into heaven, the first thing that you and I will expect to have happen is what? The judgment seat of Christ, right? That's when you and I as believers are going to be judged for our works. Now, one thing that that we want to clarify as we go um, our works are what we have done. Now, if, if we are not following the Lord, etc., here on this earth, we should realize we're not going to be rewarded there in heaven. So it is based on works. And some said, well, what does that do? How, how do you associate sin with that if a Christian were to do something against Scripture, against commandment? Well, there again, we would obviously suffer loss as a result of that, but we should expect while we're here on this earth to, to be uh, taken to the woodshed by the Lord to be corrected for those things. But we will also uh, suffer, suffer loss. So once we are judged and, and we are snatched away, you and I in heaven, we're going to be expecting a seven-year time period that's happening here on earth. We're going to be up in heaven. And the closure of, of that seven-year tribulation on earth for you and I in heaven has to do with a feast. And that is known as the what feast? That's right, marriage feast of the Lamb. So we will be with Christ in heaven, being part of that, uh, and we're going to get into the detail of that marriage feast. There are some in good good men, um, they feel it's going to be happening on earth, and they feel it's related to the nation of Israel. Uh, I disagree because we are the bride of Christ, and John 14 associates that with you and I, that Christ is coming to take us to be with him in the Father's house. And so I really believe that it will be in heaven. There are those in the chapter, as we get into that later on, much later on, that it actually describes that there are guests that are invited to this. So we would see those as the Old Testament saints that will be part of this, but the attention is on you and I, the bride of Christ. 
And so, so once that has happened, right after that in chapter 19, uh, Christ is going to be coming down on what color of a horse? White horse, right? So he's coming down, and that's a picture of conquering. The white horse is a picture of uh, conquering and victory. Uh, so he's going to come in a white horse, and he's going to, he's going to take care of uh, the nations that are here, and he's, he's going to be uh, bringing judgment down to this earth. And uh, so, so that's us. Here on this earth, though, once we are raptured, there's going to be a time period that some believe, and uh, one thing is going to happen, I personally do, and that there is going to be a, a war, uh, and Ezekiel talks about the war of Gog and Magog, that I feel is going to be that which is going to be causing a peace treaty to be desired to be uh, uh, signed by the nation of Israel and the Ten Horns or the Confederacy that's going to be happening at the time period. And so uh, once we're snatched away, something needs to be uh, stimulating in the world the necessity of the peace treaty. And I say something has to happen because they're talking now peace treaty. Everybody's talking peace treaty. But guess what? It isn't happening. So something has to cause them to say, we need this now. No more delay. Let's make this happen. And that's where the Antichrist comes on the scene and says, hey, I got this. And he has just the right verbiage, the promise of peace, as Thessalonians says, but then said, sudden destruction is going to be happening. Satan has nothing to do with peace and tranquility. He is about bringing chaos as a result of deception. And so he's going to cause this peace treaty, and that, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is the beginning of the, great, of the tribulation time period. He says, in the middle of that week, and we're going to see these in detail as we go on, in the middle of that week, something's going to happen that God, Christ even describes in Matthew 24 that's going to change everything. And that's when the Antichrist is going to do what? He's going to, that's right, he's going to go into the third temple, desecrate that third temple, and then Jesus describes it as, after that happens, Great tribulation is going to happen. So God himself divides, both in Daniel 9 and Matthew 24, he divides the seven-year tribulation time period in two. That's the event that everything's going to begin to change at that point. Matter of fact, how intense? Jesus said after that happens, there is going to be great tribulation as has never been on the earth before. So we can't even say, oh, it's just like uh, never, nor will there ever be again anything that happens like that last three and a half. And you associate the woes um, with that in great horror that's going to be happening uh, on the earth as a result of, of, of God's judgment. So, so all that being said, the end of the trip is when Jesus Christ comes back and he's going to be having a judgment uh, between the sheep on the right hand, which are the believers, the goats, which are on the left hand, which are the non-believers, they will be separated. Those sheep then will be the ones that will be in, able to inherit the earth in human bodies. So they will literally be on this earth, human bodies, and as we're going to see in the millennial reign, they're going to be having children, um, and this, this millennial reign or thousand-year reign is going to be uh, really uh, set apart because Satan himself will, will be uh, kept in a pit, if you will, chained up, and he will not be able to affect anybody on the earth for a thousand years. And then at the end of that thousand years, he's released. Now, you all are thinking right now, why? why? <laughs> let's just cut to, let's get to the new heaven and new earth, right? But there is something that God needs to show again to the world at that time period. And that is, by nature, man chooses evil. They choose wrong. They choose rebellion. This is what we've seen historically. You always have these guys, a picture of the Antichrist, that come up and, and kill, the, kill the, the prince or kill the good guys so they can take over the, the, the world, and, and it becomes communism, it becomes dictatorship, and, and freedom is stripped, and we dictate. And that's what the Antichrist is all about, dictation. He's telling everybody, this is what you do, this is how you buy, this is how you sell. I'm over government, I'm over religion, I'm over the finances, I control it all. And so, sure enough, that's going to happen again. He's going to stir rebellion in the lost people at the end of the millennial reign. 
And he's going to cause this rebellion. It tells us they're going to be coming from the four corners, north, south, east, west of the world, to merge upon Jerusalem. And at that point is when, when God causes an a, uh, incredible fervent heat that's going to destroy the world. So there's going to have to be a separation again of the righteous, the godly are going to be separated and then God's going to destroy the earth. And then, of course, after that, there's another judgment. Everybody remember what that last judgment is going to be and what that's called? Great white throne judgment. So that judgment will be for only lost people. The one we talked about earlier is only for the church. That's you and I, the believers. That's what's been promised to us. And this, this one is for all the lost going back to Genesis 4 with Cain, who killed his brother Abel, on through, all lost people will be brought to this judgment and then cast into the the lake of fire. And then in chapter 21 of Revelation, we saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first have been destroyed, have been passed away. And then God says, I'm going to be making all things new, no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more, no more. All these no mores is going to be taking place. So we'll get into that. Uh, anxious to, to get into that. I had a chance to get down to, to Friends of Israel one day uh, this week. I uh, wish I could have gone a lot more but that's what they were uh, addressing is what we just talked about uh, as far as uh, tribulation and then uh, uh, part of the uh, new earth that, that, that God's going to be creating. And it does have everything to do with the book of Genesis because that's the kingdom. Finally, the kingdom is made right. Everything that God originally created in his purpose is finally made perfect. Um, and, and what's awesome is it's going to be better than Eden because we know there's no devil and we know there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil, only the tree of life. So it will be a continual, eternal state. And that's why in Peter, and we'll see these verses later on, even you and I, the church, look forward to the new heaven and the new earth because we're going to be engaged and, and be part of that uh, also. So there's the big picture. There's the big picture. Uh, we're in uh, page number 34 at the very bottom, point number five tonight. And uh, in the Revelation, we're in the fourth chapter, and this is where John has been taken up to be given this vision of the future, the things that will be after the church age. So, uh, most of what we are talking about now, because we are seen as the 24 elders, the church is, we will be part of all of this in heaven. Chapter 5, we will also, also be part of watching all of this transpire and take place. Now, you say, well, why is everybody crying? We knew this was coming. John is given this vision. He didn't know its end. This is all brand new to him. So, sure enough, as he's receiving this vision in chapter 5, the weeping and the crying is because we have to find somebody worthy of opening up this, these seven seals. So we'll get into that uh, uh, down the road. But tonight, we're going to look at verses, uh, especially verse 7. Let's go ahead and rehearse, in, starting in verse 2. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. We established last week, that would be the... Father. And he that sat was to look upon like Jasper. We described all of these and the sardine, uh, sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne and a sight like unto emerald. So we talked about how each one of these represent diamond. Uh, we have a red ruby. We have a rainbow uh, that reflects on the, the uh, promises of God and the covenants that God has with man. The emerald has to do with truth and wisdom. So all of these reflect on the character of God, the Father, the one on the throne. Verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. We established several weeks ago that that 24 elders would be those who represent us you say, do you know why? Uh, I've already said, I really don't know why. Some have associated um, uh, the 12, 12 leaders from the Old Testament, 12 le leaders from the New. Uh, but that, to me, doesn't make sense because we already have association for the Old Testament saints. 
Um, so why would you connect them with the 24 elders? And to me, the only thing that makes sense is the, the church. And so going on, it says, upon seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting. So now there's our position, which is a throne. And we have white raiment, picture of the righteousness that's given by Jesus Christ to the saints. And they had on their heads crowns of gold, showing that you and I will be in heaven. We will already have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. We will already have received our crowns. This is all before the tribulation time period starts. Help you? Right there is probably one of the clearest reasons why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. So we're already in heaven, we're already have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, and we have already received our crowns. And at the end of this chapter, we are the ones seen as throwing these crowns at the feet of the one seated on the throne to honor him. So that is to be to be uh, studied a little later on. Verse 5, out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices. Boy, we know about those thunderings, don't we, lately here? Uh, it's amazing how God says, let me, let me try to give you something that is familiar to understand what's going on in heaven. And this, this is the thought of, of strength, and you can't control it. And this is God's power that is being uh, witnessed here the loud, the strength. And there, of course, were the seven lamps, uh, which is a picture of the menorah, uh, of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So this will be the seven administrations uh, that the Spirit of God has, and these are all seen in the seven different uh, uh, candlesticks. So, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, that would be the holiness of God. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were, here it is, four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So keep that in mind. So we have four beasts that have eyes in front and back. And so, of course, eyes in Scripture are a picture of seeing or knowing. So these have the ability to understand all around and to see all around, and therefore it's a picture of what God knows, and that is that he is all-knowing, omniscient, can see everything, all ages, all time. And so the eyes seeing, uh, you're starting to think, you know, I remember something else, someplace else talking about a bunch of eyes on a wheel and seeing everywhere. And that's exactly where we see it in Ezekiel in chapter number 1. And so we're going to go there in a couple of minutes. Now, we're going to, to in a minute, uh, take you back to the Old Testament. We're going to see Isaiah first, 6, and then we're also going to see the book of Ezekiel. And you, as we read this, you're going to say, that sounds just like Revelation and chapter 4. And you're right. So the Old Testament is going to shed light on this portion of Scripture. Who are these four beasts or translated creatures? Um, it's interesting. There are these four, and then we're also going to see a beast that comes up out of the sea, and we're going to see another beast that comes up out of the earth. These are individuals that we will know as men that are the first beast will be the Antichrist himself that comes out of the sea, which is a picture of coming out of the nations. So we see him as a Gentile. Then we see the second one coming up out of the earth, who is the false prophet. This false prophet, some believe that he could possibly be a Jew. Uh, and some have also associated uh, the false prophet with Rome because of the seven mountains. So some have actually associated uh, the papacy uh, with the false prophet. And that's possible because he's speaking to the nations and somehow he has this authority that more lean towards him being a Jew nowadays, those who are studying this out. Uh, and which would make sense when you think of the prophets, you think of Judaism, etc. So so that we'll discuss a little closer to the time. So here are some of the beasts that are talked about. Um, these are not to be confused with the four horsemen. Okay, So we have this number four, 
And so we don't want to associate him with that. That's not until chapter 6. So this is a scene that's in heaven. And these four uh, have these attributes about them. And uh, as some have said, these, these attributes that we're going to see are closely associated with the character of God, omniscience, etc. So we're going to see in Isaiah who these four beasts are and what they do. And then we're going to see how they shed light on the character of God. And I'll repeat that. These four beasts shed light on the character of God. That's how I interpret this. So let's go to Isaiah 6. You sleeping yet? This is a good time to nap. I can really... I'm amazing at putting people to sleep. It's just... Yeah. So when you think of Isaiah and uh, all the content of this incredible book, some have called Isaiah the gospel of the Old Testament because there's so much about the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll see the sufferings of Christ, the servant, um, uh, uh, many names that are associated with Jesus Christ. Uh, we also have much to do with the millennial reign in this book. So it is packed full. So early on in this book is a vision that many of you will remember. Verse number one. Right on time, right? It's thunderings. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Picture is the glory of God with this train just filling this entire room. And as you can already see, since it was mentioned first, the attention is on the one seated on this throne. And as you remember, in Revelation, in chapter number 4, there is one that is seated on his throne. Verse 2, above it, that is above the throne, where the Lord, which is Adonai, uh, that's the word for him there in that text, Adonai is on his throne, and above it stood the seraphims. Now, the seraphims are a name for angelic beings. We have cherubims, we have seraphim, right? So these are, are different names dealing with unique offices that they were, were created to, to do. Um, we have cherubs uh, having a unique relationship with mankind. Here the seraphim are absolutely unique in their creation and their, their, their looks and then their functionality, what they're actually here uh, to do. And here is the one clear text that describes to us what these four angels are up to. So it says, with uh, each one of the seraphim had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two or twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Then notice verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Jehovah Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So a name change to really give evidence of the one that is seated on the throne. The word Jehovah or capital Lord is dealing with the great I am, the self-existing one, the one that said to Moses, you tell them, I am has sent thee unto them. I am. So, he is the Lord of the hosts, multitudes, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. Now we have these seraphim. Now, we're going to go back to our text again in the Revelation. And we're going back to chapter number four again. So in verse 6, we have these four beasts that are full of eyes before the Lord. Now notice verse 7. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast 
uh, like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. Okay, you remember what we just described back in Isaiah? Six wings. Seeing it? And about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Their job for all of eternity is to be around the throne of God to point the attention of the heavens right on the Father to glorify Him for all of eternity. The attention is not towards us. It is to cause our attention to go to Him for, the, for His glory. So the similarities in Isaiah 6 are that these beasts have six wings. Their job is to cry, holy, holy, holy. Why three times? Wouldn't one be enough? He is holy. You would think that that would be evidence in his, in his character. And yet many, and I think rightfully so, proclaim it three times, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit of God. Because God is holy, He is holy, He is holy. And so this reflects on the Godhead. Uh, God does not put things in Scripture just to fill in the pages. There is intent, and that's what we have to look for, Scripture with Scripture, to see intent for us to be able to have a full knowledge and a confident knowledge in all things. Tonight is about these four creatures who have these six wings. They're in heaven. That's where we're at, at this one throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy. So I would then interpret these four creatures as four seraphim. Their job is to bring all the attention to the throne, to bring worship to the Father for all of eternity. That is the angelic job, angels' jobs. Um, by the way, we do participate in that. In heaven, we're going to do it joyfully. No problem. Here on this earth, though, sadly, it seems like we have to stimulate or find a reason, this is a really good day, and then we can be energized to worship the one who was on the throne and to proclaim holiness is his name. It's sad that because of our sinful nature that we own and we have, that it's work, but it is work. Because we have to change our minds and filter the problems and the things that we're going through to realize that this one that we will be seeing on the throne is there right now. This is happening right now. We won't see it happen until we finally arrive in heaven, either by death or through rapture. But we will see it. At that point, it is going to be the no, most natural thing to do. Not just because everyone is doing it. It's because of being in the presence of holiness. Man is not holy. You and I are not holy. We're sinners. But God has created in us through the person of Jesus Christ, specifically through the blood of Christ, a holiness that we are literally declared saints or holy in the sight of God. Positionally in Christ, I am already holy. Matter of fact, as Christ is, we have been given his righteousness. But when we finally drop this robe of flesh and rise, as the old songwriter put, and seize the everlasting prize and shout while going through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. That's when we're finally going to get this. There will no longer be limitations and restrictions that we have right now. Both in mind, in body, um, it's just 
crazy how when we say, let's pray, immediately it is hard for us to focus on one thing and that's talk to God. Our mind begins to drift and wander of things and times and events and problems and we, we, we get self-centered and we forget when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, this is how you should pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed be thy name. This is something that we are to own now, ladies and gentlemen. Incorporate in your prayer bragging on God. That's what Jesus was teaching us to do. No one is like him. So as we address him, we address him as such. No other being, no other God before you. You are the one sole source of life and light. You are all. So I sometimes rehearse the words that I'm experiencing, whether it, I'm experiencing God's mercy or I'm experiencing God's love or I'm experiencing God's comfort for me. I then talk to him and I give him the glory for that attribute that he owns and God and God alone owns, that he has poured that out to me. And in my prayer, I want to rehearse that to God, to recognize with gratitude, I recognize, God, that this grace that I have received or this holiness that I have received is through you. I cannot do it. So I'm going to give credit to whom credit is due. Jesus taught us how to pray, incorporating holiness uh, to the Lord. And that's the banner, holiness to the Lord. And... Uh, the banner, he says, over top of us, we sing that song, the banner over us is love. Okay, we're doing good. Now we're going to go to Ezekiel. So as we're going to Ezekiel, uh, this is where I'm going to need you to put your thinking caps on just a little bit. Some of you who have been with me on Tuesday mornings, uh, this will be old hat. You already have it memorized. And uh, you could get up here and teach it yourself. And I know that, but they pay me to do it, so I'm going to do it for you. Ezekiel chapter number 1. Uh, let's start in uh, verse number 4. Ezekiel 1, verse 4. I'll wait for a moment because I hear pages turning yet, and that's okay. Ezekiel chapter number 1, starting in verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Does that ring a bell? And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. Everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like a sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Now, there's a word that you are going to see consistently through this text, and it is the word like. Okay? When you see the word like, it is a picture of something, a typology. The words like and as are words to help you and I to realize, oh, this is like. So when, uh, it, uh, when John was baptizing the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I saw um, the Spirit descending like a dove. That does not mean the Spirit of God is a dove. The only thing that we can understand is it came down gracefully, uh, if you will, flying like a dove would. And he's like, that's about the only thing on this earth I could say that this is related to, like this. And so now God is talking of symbols here. They, verse number eight, they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. They have four in their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a 
man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had four, and the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. If you were to go back to the Revelation, those exact same four faces on those four beasts are the same. So we have the face of the lion, the ox, man, and an eagle. Okay? So we have four faces reflecting on each four of these. They are the face of, first of all, the lion. The second is the ox. The third is man. And the third is an eagle. You say, I bet that represents something, doesn't it? And it most certainly does. And that's what we're going to get into in just a moment. But first, I want you to look at verse 13. For the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance like burning coals of fire and the like appearance uh, appearance of lamps. You remember us in Revelation 4 talking about the menorah? Uh, went up and down among the living creatures of fire bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Anybody remember hearing anything about lightning in Revelation in chapter number 4? I hope you caught that. Um, and verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and their four had one likeness, and the appearance of their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of the wheel. Drop down to verse number 18. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings there were full of eyes round about them four. So remember in Revelation chapter 4? He talked about the eyes related to these. So, to me, Ezekiel is also shedding light on these four beasts in a different light. Um, I realize it's not a perfect because of the wing number and things along that line, but what we do see in this text is the simil- simil- uh, similarities in regards to those four characteristics of the faces of each one. So here's where I get to, to try my very best to express to you what I believe God is trying to teach us. From the Old Testament, God reveals the Son. The Son is Jesus Christ, the Messiah that was going to be coming, and He had specific purpose in coming the first time. He also has a specific purpose in coming the second time. The first time Jesus Christ came was to, to give his life on Calvary, to die for our sin, to take care of the kingdom spiritually. The next time Jesus Christ comes back, since he's already taken care of it spiritually, he's going to come back and take care of things physically. So he's literally going to come back to this earth to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. So the first time that he came, there were writers that expressed in different ways who Jesus Christ is. Isn't it interesting that we have four Gospels? Why four? Wasn't one enough? Matter of fact, uh, the first three are known as the synoptic Gospels. And what that means is they're very similar in their storylines and the parables and etc. So it's like, yeah, you can read it here, you can look it over in Mark, and the same story there, and Few of those are seen in all four Gospels, but we see it this way. Let's say uh, Bruce and Nancy and, uh, and Bonnie and I were at a window, and we're looking out this window, and we're just talking, and before our eyes, an accident happens. We all saw this accident, and sure enough, we're like, wow, look at that devastation. The police are coming, the ambulance are coming, and sure enough, since we were eyewitnesses, we're all going to be pulled to the side and we're all going to one-on-one express to the police, what did you see happen? Do you think we're all going to be saying the exact same thing? Probably not. You know, some may say, oh, I saw the car that is blue. (laughs) And the guys are going like, I don't know what color it was. Of course it was blue. 
saw it, right? And they're going to see things that we don't see, and then we're going to say, oh, yeah, the one was a Buick and the other was a Ford. And the ladies are like, they were? So we're going to see things differently because it's different angles, but it's the same accident. To me, in a positive note, not that the life of Christ is an accident, but it gives you perspective of we have four different gospels looking at the same time period, the life of Christ, but they all see it differently. So the gospel of Matthew that is pointed to the Jewish nation is showing to the Jewish nation Jesus Christ is the king. That's the key with the gospel of Matthew. Gee, I wonder what creature would reflect king. Lion, right? The first creature, the face of a lion. So Mark comes on the scene. We have a book of Mark. Well, how does Mark portray the life of Christ as he, by inspiration, of course, is reflecting? His book is reflecting on Jesus being the servant. Many of the parables reflect servitude serving by Christ. So Christ is seen as the servant. By the way, Isaiah 52, also uh, out of the mouth of two and three witnesses, things are established. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he in Isaiah 52 also saw him as the coming uh, one who was going to be ministering or my servant as he's called in that text. So when you think of a servant, somebody that's going to be working and working and working, Guess which animal you're going to be thinking of? The ox. So even ministers are called oxen that go around treading out the corn, constantly working, going over and over things. And Christ ministered, going over and over again, the kingdom, Satan, uh, uh, salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection that was going to be happening. Everything that Christ did, he came to minister. He's helping, he's healing. He was ordained to do that gift. Uh, the, uh, to, to the people. He was the gift to the people. So he's seen as the ox or the one who is going to be the servant. That's Mark. So the book of Luke, that is the book that portrays Jesus Christ's humanity the most. Uh, the details of the cross are most, the, the greatest detail of that is seen in the book of Luke, um, the thirsting, etc. Uh, and And so uh, this book, the book of Luke, portrays Jesus in the sufferings, and, and we would see as the humanity side of Jesus Christ. And another way of saying that would be the Son of Man. So now we have the man's face portraying Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And then the last one, of course, is the gospel we're probably most familiar with, and that's the gospel of John. The Gospel of John is that incredible book where you'll see a lot of detail about who Jesus Christ is. Matter of fact, uh, we get into his, his deity in chapter number one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. You're, you're familiar with that. In this book, he comes across and says, by the way, I'm the light of the world. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the good shepherd. I am the, the, the vine, you're the branches. The list goes on. So as we see this phrase, I am, does that ring a bell? It should. It goes back to the one seated on the throne whose name is Jehovah. I am the self-existing one. And so Jesus is trying to express to the world, I'm here. God in the flesh. So John portrays Jesus as the great I am deity. And the animal, well, actually the bird in this text that would reflect the deity would be the eagle. As it, the face of the eagle would be reflecting on his, his deity. So each of these, these creatures and what they appear to be by face reflects on the very character of God in the person of Jesus Christ and why he came to this earth. So in heaven, there is a continual remembrance of the Gospels. There's a continual remembrance of why Jesus Christ came. And he came, no doubt, as the Lamb, 
but he, he also came as the Son of Man. He came as the Son of God. I forgot to bring that up in the Gospel of John, the deity, the Son of God. He came to serve. He came to show, to be king uh, to the nation of Israel, that he is going to be their coming king. So that's why he gave the kingdom talk and the Beatitudes. You know, you want to inherit the earth? You better have some meekness. That's what you want to have. And what's going to be like with my role? And this is how you're going to conduct yourselves. And so start doing it now was the, uh, the message to, to all of these. So we have the lion, the calf, or ox. We have the man and the eagle. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have Jesus Christ as the king, the servant, the son of man, the son of God, and the seraphim who represent these characteristics are before the throne crying out, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, and we are going to have the uh, opportunity to, uh, to witness all that. All that I can say is this. For, for people to say that this book that we are studying and reading is just a man-made book has not truly discovered the depth of the teachings of God to man. I am one and can say, man is not smart enough to come up with this. There is no way. That's why even in the New Testament, God describes how the prophets, like Ezekiel, would write these things down, and then after they wrote it down, they rehearsed and looked into it to even find its meaning, showing that this was not a private interpretation by Ezekiel. This is inspiration from God. He's writing these things down. It's like, oh, I was deep. I wonder what it means. Literally having to look into it. This is God's word, folks. And God is trying to shed light constantly on the, uh, the person of God, his character, his holiness, all seen in the face of Jesus Christ and, and who he is. So now let's look back. We'll get you out a couple minutes early tonight, it looks like. Don't cheer. <laughs> you can't amen, though. I'll get you out. Beat the next rainstorm. Can we rehearse this now? Verse number five, out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices and over seven lamps, the burning of, the, uh, for, and of fire burning before the throne. These are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea like glass and a crystal. And amidst the throne, around about the throne, were these four beasts, these seraphim, full of eyes before and behind. The first beast like a lion the second beast like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. Fourth beast like a flying eagle. Um, by the way, just, just rehearse this. This is the exact way that those who laid out the New Testament, they put them in this order. It wasn't like I had to go to Matthew and then to, to Luke and back to Mark. And then the, it, this was literally in the order that we have the New Testament writings. It's powerful. They, it's as though they, they got this. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the lion, the calf, the man, the flying eagle. The four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. So in other words, these angelic beings never cease from doing this. Twenty. Four, seven, as we would say it, with no vacations and no coffee breaks. This is all they do. This is how they were created. And this is what they say. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is, and notice this, and is to come. Guess who's coming again? God in the person of Jesus Christ. So again, even though rapture has happened, there will be a second coming of God in the flesh through the person 
of Jesus Christ back to this earth. And Jesus is the one who says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I was, I am, I am going to be coming again. And all this is related to him. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And they have one job, and that is to bring glory. And that's what he rehearses in verse 9, and we'll quick. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, this is what we do. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns down before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive the following. Glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure. They are and were created, including you. You are special. A special creation of God. Nothing was created better than you greater than you, not even the angels, because the angels were never provided salvation. God came to save man. You are precious in his sight. He loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, the whole way to this earth to live that perfect, sinless life, to give his life a ransom for us. Lord, we look forward to that day. But until then, Lord, help us and teach us to worship you now as though we will then. Thank you for this time. Use it for your glory. And we will thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen.